Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show, Completely Candid, with uh, me, Christian Blandon. I appreciate you guys, whether you're listening or watching, or maybe even doing a combination of both. I don't know. That's totally up to you. Live life the way you want it. I uh, just want to give a quick shout out to those of you who have gone onto the Anchor site and have decided to go ahead and become monthly contributors. For me, that's just, it's awesome. It's super nice. It's super flattering. And it just makes me happy because that means I'm doing something right as far as keeping you guys interested and involved. Um, I just, aim to make sure that my guests here are awesome and honestly just worthwhile i'm trying to educate myself and just have a good time like meeting other people and bringing you guys along with me there to experience it and just be part of the conversation hopefully you guys are learning something too and learning about what's going on with the world and just kind of having a good time and you know whether it's just on a commute to work or while you're making dinner whatever it is i don't know maybe you're this is your your pastime maybe it's your hobby just listen to podcasts and again i appreciate you for listening and watching mine you are awesome thank you so much um let's go straight into it today's guest is a good friend of mine um we actually went to high school together and to be honest like we didn't hang out back in the day um we just kind of like knew each other uh knew of each other we had mutual friends and i always knew him as just like one of those skater guys from school and he was always super cool and um now he's an artist i had no idea that he was pretty much a lifelong artist and he started his brand uh doing uh apparel like this if you're watching this is a cool little uh audrey hepburn little take on a classic photo of hers and adding in his own flavor uh and you'll kind of see like his brand image with like the yellow happy face smiley face happy tears uh sort of thing going on uh, they, 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 that may sound like a bunch of nonsense but he's gonna go into it and explain what it all is he's gonna explain what is organ organized it's called disorganized depictions ladies and gentlemen and everything in between <laughs> i now present to you the man the myth the artist derek diza all right we are here we are live kind of oh right now we're live we're living it living it up <laughs> i'm here with who are you sir this is derek derek diza uh i am an artist from Southern California, Christian and I, uh, we went to high school together and, um, warriors, warriors. Yeah. Woodbridge warriors, uh, spent most of my time in Irvine, but I wasn't, I was doing art back then. Um, a little bit, didn't really know what I was doing with my life necessarily in high school. It was just kind of those like punk kids who'd like skate and have fun and party. But, um, in college, I started taking uh, art a little bit more seriously. Work uh, was was my major was entrepreneurship, so I always knew I wanted my own business. And then, uh, kind of what happened after college is I worked a nine to five job in online marketing, learned a lot there. Um, was trying to start my own business and working late hours there, got fired. <laughs> Sick. And, uh, Off to a great start. <laughs> yeah. And then um, started my own company uh, shortly after. But this, uh, and the company is Disorganized Depictions. We are now a mural advertising agency specializing in developing large scale murals in unique locations specific to action sports, but the brand originally started as a streetwear brand. So it's kind of evolved a lot, but altogether the, what the company really embodies is art community. Um, and now action sports, just because, um, I've always been a skateboarder and kind of loved that area and just thought it'd be a good way for us to differentiate from our competition. But that's me. That's, uh, I guess my story in a relatively short amount of time. All right. And we're done. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for those of you watching and if you're listening, you could be watching, right? We got basically probably your signature, um, little 
piece yeah. here, or it's not so little here, but <laughs> uh, I'm wearing it. I'm um, a little little pocket tee. Yeah. Or where the pocket would be for this one. The logo. And this is uh, Happy Tears, right? Happy Tears, yeah. So, um, how do you come? And for those of you that are just listening, so there are some eyes. The eye, are these pupils, the eyes, balls, yeah, are actually happy faces, yeah. So, um, but the eyes are crying. Mm-hmm. So, how do you come across, or how, how do you come across? How do you come up with this thing? Um, that was interesting. You know, I don't think any. I feel like all art concepts are inspired by a lot of people and this design just started as something I was drawing in my sketchbook, something fun. Um, I was experimenting back in the day with a lot of uh, fine line art. So like really small pens trying to go really detailed in uh, just a really, really small space. And I don't really know where a lot of the inspiration for, the smiley faces came from i've seen i saw i remember seeing um i used to draw eyes all the time when i was young and i remember seeing these anime style eyes that just really resonated with me so i kind of did my own take on them and just wanted to make it a little bit more interesting so i thought it'd be interesting to have just i guess two eyes that are crying but inside of the eyes the pupils are smiling to kind of give the piece like a little more of a ambiguous feeling. All my all my work is very is like heavily based. All my individual work I should I should say because the company now is made of multiple artists, but all my individual work is based on ambiguity and letting someone come up with their own meaning for the art rather than my meaning just because art isn't made to like necessarily inspire the artist doesn't make art necessarily always for themselves as much as they do for the world and for other people. So I see it as when I, when I come up with a concept, I like, I like people to have their own take on things. I don't like the message to be super clear cut. And that's just kind of how I came up with the design. It started as uh, in my sketchbook and then moved to um, t-shirts and now it's on a big mural in my, in my room. Heck yeah, man. Yeah. Um, and then the restroom was pretty freaking cool. You. Um, you guys can hop on his TikTok to see what's going on here. Yeah. Um, yeah, man. I always knew you as a like skater. Yeah. Always hung out with skaters. And so, and even on Instagram, I'm like, oh, yeah, he's doing skate stuff. Mm-hmm. And I didn't really have any idea that you were doing any sort of art. Um, and it sounds like you've been doing it since you were really young. How, like, how mm-hmm. early do you remember having an interest in? art i've been drawing like all my life i don't think there i can't like remember a time where i didn't where like i don't think there's like any moment where i was like yeah i really like art i I think i want to get into art now it's like kind of just has been something that's always stuck with me i didn't really share it as much in high school like i would make some pieces for people like as gifts here and there um and i think there's like a couple if you go back to my personal instagram from like way back when but it just wasn't really something that I was say was like a big focus in my life. It was just something I did for fun. But skateboarding back then was a big focus in my life. I remember back then I was like, yeah, it'd be so cool to be pro one day. Like, I don't know if I'm <clears> going to be pro, but it'd be really cool to be pro, start my own skateboarding company. And kind of as I got older, I realized that skateboarding doesn't have a lot of money in it. It's definitely more for the, for the passion. Um, I mean, not to say that like people like Rob Deerdeck and, Tony Hawk haven't made like empires in skateboarding. Right. But, um, yeah, it kind of was just like a skateboarder back then. And, but now it's very much swapped where it's like skateboarding. If I'm lucky, get to do it maybe like twice a month. And art is all the time, even though right well, right now it's more of being a business owner and doing art on the side, but a, a little bit of both, I guess. Yeah, man. Uh, especially as you get older and one, you have to make money, <laughs> yep. trying to pay the bills. And if you can make it something bigger, then I think everyone would love to do something that they love to do. Mm-hmm. And also, but yeah, body isn't as uh, strong. And like, you know, those falls just, you know, you feel those <laughs> a little bit yeah, more. Totally. Your joints are a little bit more achy. Things are cracking a little bit more than when you were just like 12, 13, 15. We're just like, all right, just keep going, yep. keep going, keep going. 
And uh, good <laughs> on you if you know, you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, and you're still killing it as a skateboarder, but it definitely takes a toll. Um, but yeah, man, that's, that's super sick. And so was it, has it always just been drawing, at least when you were younger? Did you experiment with any other mediums of art? Not at all back in the day. I started just like only doing pencil work, got into like doing some pen like sometime in um, sometime in high school slash college. Told myself I would never want to be a painter. Like I was like, I never want to paint. I don't <laughs> care to learn about like color theory and all this stuff. And now it's like, and then like fast forward a couple years later and it's like all I'm doing and I never spend time drawing anymore. It's all just like painting murals or um, working on Photoshop, which I also told myself I would never do. So <laughs> I think it's just like important as an artist. It's, it's really important to not limit yourself in like the mediums that you're experimenting with and to just kind of, kind of try a lot of different things and see what resonates more with you, things that you like. And more often than not, something that you think that you hate like could be really exciting. It depends on what you're doing with it. It depends on who's teaching it to you. But that's like kind of just the overarching rule in life, you know? Like college students, when you go to college, you don't – most college kids don't know their major. Like right when they get in, they don't know what they yeah. want to do for the rest of their I life. I changed mine like three or four times. Yeah, me too. And like I want to do architecture. Then I was thinking about graphic design, thinking about marketing, and then decided to go with entrepreneurship. But it's really just kind of just like the overruling thing in life. Like a lot of kids, a lot of people say they feel lost about what they want to do, but it's maybe it's because like you haven't tried enough things, you know. And yeah. The more things you try, it just opens more doors for you. Um, I mean, what a shitty question to ask an eighteen-year-old. Hey, man. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I know things have been just pretty much the same. Where you just wake up be at school first thing in the morning and you just learn and then do some homework, maybe a sport and a hobby. Uh, so now the last four, six, eight years, however it takes, uh, however long it takes for you to figure this out, what do you want to spend the next of your college or your last of your learning years yeah. studying? What do you want to learn to do for the rest of your life? Yeah. <laughs> like I know you've only been around for two decades now for the next four, five, what do you want to just only do for the rest of that time? <laughs> to make money, put food in your mouth and a roof over your head. That yeah. is an insane question to ask someone that's not even 20 years old. Yeah. Like a lot of kids, especially in that time, it's like, I mean, of course, like given like I had a job since I was like 16 and I think a lot of people have, but a lot of people also haven't. So it's like you're getting people ready for, you're like trying to prep people to get ready to learn how to make money, like get into a professional field. And yeah, like you said, just like asking them what they want to do for the rest of their life. It just seems daunting. And then you see all these people that graduate from all these people that graduate from college that are just doing things that are like have nothing to do with their degree. And especially now, it's like with all this shift, like in my opinion, like with COVID, right? Like with everything's shifting online. Mm -hmm. Everything is really largely based on like self-education, like you going out and learning like, yeah, you have your professors teaching, but you're paying like X amount of dollars. Like, especially if you're going to like, imagine going to a private school right now during COVID, like USC or something, right? Like Dude, you're paying yeah. like 60 K for online courses. Like you could literally get those courses anywhere. Really, like if if you were to search the internet, depending on your major, right? If you're right. If, if you're trying to be a doctor, like you should probably learn from <laughs> this from like You probably shouldn't just be like dissecting pigeons and yeah, street yeah. rats, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But given like you know, especially in the business world, like there's just so many resources now, like Masterclass, Udemy, YouTube, like literally you can learn so many things on YouTube. You know what I mean? Yeah, like man. just self education I think is growing more and more important in, in our day and age, especially with, we're, we're in the information age, there's, you can find these things anywhere. You don't really need to go to college anymore. So it's like, I don't know, it's almost like this arbitrary rush that society gives us to like, learn all these things in four years and then do it for the rest of your life. But like, you know, all of life is a learning process and you have to, you have to spend time self-educating to, to be great at anything and to find out what you actually enjoy. Like you can't, you can't, you can't depend on college to, to teach you what you enjoy. You got to figure it out yourself. Right. Right. And yeah, these younger generations, 
Um, definitely ours included, I feel, are like continuing to break that usual. It's like, okay, you know, well, mm-hmm. back in the 80s, you know, that was the thing to do. In the 90s, you, you know, if you want to be successful, you go to college and you'll make a lot of money and then you'll live a happy life. And that's not always the case, uh, especially with, say, like the past 20 years or so. There's been a lot of uncertainty. There's been a lot of pullback. Yes, we build back up every time. However, you're not always going to be on, you know, the lucky side of that deal. And especially now in 2020, so many people I've seen have like, oh, I lost my job or now my industry has been hit so hard that everything's been shut down. You know, all these companies are going out of business and it's not up to them. You know, even though if they put in that work and got the degree, a lot of people are shifting. I've seen a lot more small businesses and entrepreneurs come up, which is great. However, that is not something that everyone plans for. Sometimes they just happen to have these skills and they had to put food on the table and they're like, all right, cool, let's do this thing. And then it's great if it works out. But sometimes that's just like, hey, you know, I have to learn something right now because I need to make sure the lights stay on and I can keep doing my thing and, you know, get back to or maintain a normal way of living for myself. Yeah. And so, yeah, man, I think, I think, ROP classes are super dope. Um, even though I didn't take very much, or I actually didn't take any, but I did do a lot of activities in high school, and um, I didn't necessarily push myself like, oh, I need to try new things. I was just genuinely curious about a lot of things. But ROP, there's cool things like for uh, retail, and um, I think even for being like an EMT. And I, I remember like reading the list, I'm like these are like legitimate classes on yeah it's basically like learning and sometimes even doing an internship for that industry or that particular job at a very young age which i think is a great time right just before college to be like okay do i actually like this thing yeah will i or maybe i try this out however long it is six weeks a semester and see i don't know anything about it but maybe this will be my thing Mm -hmm. and it's not like taking a college course or getting an actual job where you have to spend either time and or money towards learning this craft and building a year or two around it and then deciding, oh, you know what, this isn't for me. When yeah. you just do it over the course of a couple months. I'd much rather do that. I think school Expedited should just trade school. Right. And I think this should just be exposing young, especially teenagers, to different paths a lot earlier on rather than mm-hmm. just teaching the same exact thing to every kid. I yeah. think there should be more, I'd say like personalized testing and being understand, well, hey, look, you know, whether it's like a Myers-Briggs sort of deal, but get into like the mental and behavioral side of the students, if they can create some sort of thing where like they take tests every once in a while to see where their mind is at, where their interests are at. So that way you can shift these kids towards doing something that actually makes sense for the way they think and the way they yeah, they definitely. create and actually feel happy doing, right? Because I know there's a lot of people who's like, oh, I don't really like being a doctor, but I make X amount of money and I have a nice house and a nice car. So I just truck through that, you know, three, four days a week and work those 12 hour shifts. And then I get to, you know, go on nice vacations and stuff. Not a lot of fun, but I'll do it. You know, I'm pretty sure if that doctor could you know, be a piano player, if that's what they love doing, is playing piano, I'm sure they'd much rather do that if they got paid the same exact amount. Or yeah. in a lot of cases, when it comes to creatives, the thing I hear over and over again is, if I can just make a living, pay the bills, and, you know, it'd be great to have a little something extra, then I'd be happy. Yeah, yeah. Almost every single artist I've ever talked to said, if I can just make a living, like an actual living, be able to live life and pay for everything just fine, not struggle, don't need to be living a life of luxury, but at least I get to do what I want to do. I, I think I'm all about that. Having yeah. happiness over luxury and flash and clout. I mean, who's that all for anyways? Yeah, I think um, artists in general, they ask the wrong question, which is, uh, you know, like, is happiness more important than money? It's 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 like 
it's a valuable question, but it's not the right question to be asking because what you should what you should be asking is how do I how how can I be happy and make money at the same time? And it's really important um, to aim really high because more more like more often than not, like we, like you don't always hit you don't hit all your goals. You know what I mean? We have certain goals, we hit them, and then we're proud of them. Some people don't hit all their goals. Or I know there are some people that are like maximizers that are like super that are kind of part of the like productivity cult like the extreme mm, productivity yeah. cult where you're like getting everything done but more often than not people don't hit all their goals so it's really important to aim really high so because if you aim really high and you come up short it's better than aiming at like this this m- mediocre level of like yeah I just make some money to survive because if you come short of that then you're not surviving but if right. you're trying to aim towards like yeah i want to make a mansion i want to like i want to buy a mansion with all my riches from the art industry or whatever it may be if you come short like at least maybe you have enough money to buy a house it's not a mansion but it's really important to do that and for creatives it's like you're so creative in this in the space of like your whatever your little niche, your talent is, whatever your medium is, right? So like you're like for me, like creative at, at, at murals, right? Like concept development for murals or for skateboards or for streetwear. But you can apply that same creativity to making money. You know what I mean? Like there's so many ways to make money oh, now. Careful at the table. I think it's picking oh, oh, up a little oh, bit. <laughs> sorry. There's so many ways. There's so many ways to make money now. And it's just like it's – it's important to be creative with those to understand them and then be a little bit creative with different sources of income that you can build through your talents because you know it's it's like if one thing isn't working and you're tried that thing for a long time like you might need to get a little bit more experimental like we talked about before and kind of try different approaches within your space like within your industry uh making money it's just like like for example, if I do something, if I create a digital piece on Photoshop, you can I can sell it, I can print it and sell it as prints. I can print it on shirts and drop ship them. So someone else is handling all the production for me, they're handling all the shipping for me, and all my job is is to create art and generate interest to the art, like basically get people to click on my website, see my art, and purchase it. But I don't have to deal with the shipping. I don't have to deal with actually printing the shirt. Um, there's so many different things that you can print stuff on. Uh, you can license your work, put it on, um, you know, like those websites like uh, Pexel or like Stock Photo or whatever. Right. And you can license your work that way. And of course, it's like easier said than done. You have to study and you have to understand the mechanics behind each each revenue stream you're trying to build, but. There's so many ways to make money in the creative space now. And I'm not sure exactly how that works for the music industry. Um, Maybe you know more, you probably know more there than me or um, my partner, Lisa, would know a lot more there too because she did, she does, she's done a lot of work in the music industry. She was, she was like basically like hanging out with like some of the best, some of the best artists in San Diego at a certain point. But, um, yeah, just like getting creative with making money too, you know, and not and definitely not limiting yourself because if you always have the men, if you always have the mentality of a starving artist, you will always be a starving artist. You have to right. get rid of that mentality. You have to, you have to come. You have to think from like a more abundant state of mind. Yeah, it's definitely possible to monetize your hobby, your happiness. Now, yeah. I think it's the easiest it's ever been. You know, shout out Gary V. He's always uh, telling people like if you can't do it now then you suck and if you're not trying now <laughs> then you definitely suck um not to be again out of context it sounds negative but basically what he's getting at is you know before the internet which wasn't that long ago even in like 15 years ago 2005 yeah. you know who was selling stuff online big companies really i think ebay was a thing um but you wouldn't find an artist being, oh, hey, yeah, I'm going to sell murals or even T-shirts and, you know, go buy them. You know, that, and how do you get the word out back in 2005? You know, mm-hmm. that's a very, very different space 
Um, that's when MySpace yeah. was still a thing. Um, and so I, I don't remember really seeing people like promote their stuff on MySpace. I think musicians had like music pages, you know, and that was probably be about it. And then Facebook came around and I'll like what you're doing on Instagram and TikTok and just showing people what you're doing in your process and just finding different ways to be creative as far as like showing off what you do and yeah. seeing other people. There's this girl uh, I saw on Twitter and she makes, I think soap and other skin products. Sick. And, um, I think it was just something she was doing on the side. And then now she like blew up yep. and the tweets that I see from her now I'm following her just cause I love like seeing like cause she'll post videos of like her process. And she has like this baby, like one or two years old, and she's like always like tweeting out how busy and backed up she is because she's still doing it just all yeah, herself, parent. just grinding it out. Yes, being a parent. And I'm sure now kind of either continuing whatever her daily routine was or now shifting into doing this, you know, yeah. business more full time. And her tweets are always like, hey, guys, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm backed up. I just so many orders. I did, you know, like a thousand or a hundred, you know, soaps to last night. And so she's just killing it. It's crazy yeah, how like just because that. she sent out a couple of tweets and then she went viral and people are just wanting to, you know, use her products. And she just showed some like before and afters of how it helped uh, with skin and whatnot. And of course, you know, for me, I love and appreciate just the grind of a single mother, you know, trying to support her kid and, you know, all the more reason, you know, not that you have to have a testimony or this crazy struggle, but it's as simple as putting something out there. And that's why I kick myself every time too. I'm like, what am I doing? You know, I, I, I've <laughs> done so good at becoming less of a perfectionist. And I think a lot that's of good. people, a lot of artists too, can really get into that, yeah. you know, sentiment where whatever you put out, you want it to be a great representation of who you are and where you think your quality yeah. is. And again, back to the whole Gary Vee thing. But no one's perfect, right? No one's perfect. You just no got to put perfect. stuff out, man. Look yeah. at Beyonce. Beyonce, she's always been a good singer, at the very least a good singer, right? Go back to like Destiny's Child and compare it to now. Yes, Destiny's Child had some bops, but listen to this strength and the runs and all the things that she's done with her voice and the way she was singing compared to now and her live performances. It's incredible how much she's improved, but that's over time. You know, if you're not well, constantly like working on it, working on it, you know, putting something out, whether it's an album or even it's just a picture on Instagram. And, you know, if you're really going for it now, you're doing more biz B2B. Uh, reaching out to businesses and whatnot and get on LinkedIn, whatever it is, like mm. put yourself out there, post something, tweet, you know, even if you don't yeah, really yeah. have a following there, like you could take that same picture and pretty much post it on almost every platform. Yeah. Right? And that's kind of like what I'm trying to do now with this podcast. Content distribution. We got the video going, you know, the audio going that can go to, you know, pure audio podcast platforms, throwing this up on YouTube, taking these clips, putting it, on Instagram and TikTok Everywhere. and just like posting it, pictures, whatever. You know, there's a lot of ways to use that one piece of content. Yeah, yeah. And shift it all the way around. Yeah, definitely. You have, you brought up a lot, a lot of really important points. Um, one being, you said back in 2005, like, how do you, how do you share your stuff? How do you get, how do you get the word out? Right. And, um, that's always the question. It's not like a matter of like 2005, 2020, 2050, like 3005, like all right. Well, like that's a question that people are, are always going to ask. How do you get the word out? Right. And just like you said right now, like omni channel marketing is a great way to do that where you have all these different platforms, you develop a piece of content, you make it, you, you make it consumable for each, each platform. Because another thing to understand is, each platform is different. Um, we kind of we had to talk about this a little bit right. earlier. So it's like, for example, like if you're if you're on LinkedIn, right? You're approaching professionals and business owners. If you're on TikTok, you're approaching young kids and teenagers. You know, like so it's very different. Like for example, with our company, since we do streetwear and mural development, 
mural development, we are not going to be pushing super hard on TikTok. Like, yes, it's cool. (laughs) And like, yes, it gets people's attention because it's bold and big, right? But what we're more approaching on TikTok is kids who want to like wear the clothing, like kids that are into art, kids that are into streetwear, uh, kids that like skateboarding or something like that. You get their attention from doing something big and then you bring it back to the message of clothing. But then on LinkedIn, you're not going to be making, like we're not making clothing sales on LinkedIn. We're like trying to connect with big business owners or people that are uh, making big decisions, like they're key decision makers in their company, like right. marketers and whatnot, creative directors. And we're talking to them about mural development, how we can provide value to their business through through art and through design. And it's really important to just know that to get the word out takes a lot of consistency in making a lot of content, making sure the content is consumable for the different channels that you're on, getting on multiple channels and distributing it. So it's content creation and content distribution. And that's how you get the word out. Like in today's day and age with the internet and all these platforms like evolving all around us, you have Pinterest, TikTok, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, like those just to start, you know what I mean? YouTube, there's like, there's just so many ways to get the way the the word out, but and and you you talked about Gary V, right? Gary V, his strategy is make as much content as you can, like just drop content all the time, yeah. like constantly drop content, constantly drop it, like stop, like and like you said also, like stop focusing so much on being a perfectionist. Just put the content out there, let the people decide what they like about it. You're gonna get better and better over time, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's uh, like I said, it's never been easier. There's more opportunity to do that right from your phone. So you could be in your bedroom mm-hmm. doing a whole business, or at least you know exposing your yourself and your hobbies and your passion to the entire world. How's camera doing over there? We're yeah, we're back. We're back. We are so bad. What's up, camera and so YouTube? Guys having some uh, technical Instagram, difficulties TikTok. with the camera. Now nah, we're, we're good. We're good. We're having fun. That's why you just listen. I can put a little little image over there, or it, it'll just <laughs> it'll just be me talking over pitch black. It'll be fun. But yeah, I mean, again, like myself, like the hardest thing I've had to do, or one of the hardest things I've ever had to do personally uh, with my mental and my emotional um, being is letting go of being a perfectionist. Again, um, if you listen to like uh, one of my other podcasts um, with Athena's, Athena Messina talking about mental health, um, I dive into how um, a lot of that came from sports growing up as an athlete and um, being like a, a closet creative, like not really identifying that I was so into music and art in general and performing. Mm-hmm. And But there is that, that crossover in performance, right? There's athletic performance and there's creative performance. And I think that was probably the bridge yeah, yeah. of, oh, if I do this, I have to do really good. I have to be the best because if you're not the best, you're not going to get the trophy. You're not going to yeah, be yeah. the champion, whatever it may be. And so with art, that can be really toxic for oneself. Oh, really and toxic. So, yeah, yeah. And you so know, over time, it's been really easy to beat myself up. I've been there where I've posted things, let it sit and be like, this sucks. I take it down like before, like I really let anyone see it, whether it's minutes, a day, a week, a month, whatever, I've gone back and like, this doesn't make sense. I'm no good. And even still, that's still just your opinion. (laughs) That is your own opinion. You could be amazing. I think the best of the best constantly are critiquing themselves and saying, ah, it could be better. Sure. Mm -hmm. Anything could be better. Chocolate ice cream could be better. Whatever, man. There's always <laughs> going to be a next level, but you just got to appreciate the journey, right? Think of it as like a digital diary. Okay, great. That's exactly. where I was on Instagram or YouTube, TikTok, Pinterest, whatever, in 2015. Now it's 2018. Now it's 2025. It's cool. You got to think of it that way. Like This is just like a journal entry of yeah, yeah. where I was at at that point. You're always going to get better. If you keep mm-hmm. on doing it, it's just going to be better. And especially with content and trying to go viral, like especially on TikTok and now that's more popular, like we were talking earlier, things are changing a lot there as far as what becomes viral. Um, you don't know. You just got to put it out there because unless yeah. you've actually tested it, then you don't really know. And basically touching on what you were just talking about is having... 
awareness, right? Being aware of how to make people aware of you and your business or your passion, Mm -hmm. right? TikTok's going to have a certain audience. YouTube, wide range, but again, figure out those demographics. Nice thing for most of these things is if you have a business profile, they give you the stats. What's the age range? What time Mm -hmm. are they going on? What day are they watching your stuff? All those things are there. And so being able to maximize when people are paying attention to you and now leveraging that into maybe a schedule to where it's like, okay, like we were talking earlier, I want to make more TikToks, but have them all stacked up. So that way I can just release them out of this library or AKA like the drafts. Yeah, yeah. If you just do it directly on the app. So that way you don't have to worry about it. But you know, okay, maybe 12 o'clock on Wednesday is when, you know, people pay attention to me or 2 p.m. on Saturday is the time that, you know, people end up watching my videos, you know? Mm -hmm. Just being smart, it's a lot easier now to just be out there and get some attention. Yeah. And that's the game. Yeah. The the analytical side of things is really important. and often overlooked. I think people get really caught up with the um, the likes aspect of things, mm-hmm. and it's pretty. It's like important to to remember, like if you're creating something, like what is the goal of like what you're creating? Like what are you trying to do? Like say for example, you had all the likes in the world, all the comments in the world, but like what do you want someone to do like after they watch your video? Do you want them to purchase from you? Do you want them to just leave feeling inspired? Like the likes are so like meaningless like of course the engagement rate is great to like push your content out to more people but like you said like the internet like especially now when you're looking at different platforms like the platform is a diary it's like a timeline of different stages of what you're at where you're at like watching yourself grow and understanding like what is the goal and is that happening because like if for example you're trying to sell soap Right. Right. Like who cares if you have a million likes, if you only sold a bar of soap. Right. Like what does that like, what does it do? You, you need to understand like, what is your goals and how do you make those goals happen? And by sharing, you're putting yourself out there, you're allowing for you to be discovered, but you need to look a little bit more past that. And the analytics side is very important in, in terms of like understanding what the data means, how to read it and like how to, how to reach your goals by utilizing the data that's given to you. Um, But um, I has another important thing to say about that side of things, which is that if you are not attracting the audience that you want to attract and you're not getting likes or follows or whatever it is that you're trying to attract, if you're not getting it, it's only your fault. Like it's only your fault. If you're like, you need to think of the dream person that you want to interact with and then make content specifically for that person. If you're, if your content is attracting different people, that's because your content doesn't have a direct message to who you want to reach. And here's a quick way to act on that since I'm thinking about it right now. Mm -hmm. TikTok, people react to videos, right? You can go on someone's video and either just have that side by side, do edit, right? Or you can stitch, whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay. Who does Jason Derulo duet with, right? Who is Charlie D'Amelio duetting with? You know, whoever it is, whatever industry you're trying to get in front of, um, pay attention to them. The the mega influencers, right? They interact with people all the time. TikTok makes it super easy. It's like, look, Jason Derulo likes people who wear blue Mm t-shirts. Maybe have a video where you wear a blue t-shirt. Like, it's that simple. TikTok is like, boom, here it is, right? Pay attention, see what they're doing. Sometimes if you just, you know, the biggest one I'd say is the dance challenge trend, right? Mm-hmm. People will do whatever the original content creator did, right? Boom, new video, use their sound, whatever, do a cover. Musicians, do a cover of artists that you like, right? If you want to yeah, get yeah. in front of them or artists that you might want to write for if you're a songwriter. And then if you're, you know, a, someone that likes to paint, do murals, draw or you do mixed media art, then maybe they'll say, hey, cool. The artist, I'm going to do my own take on their thing. Or yeah. maybe I'll print out their thing and I'll draw over and add all this other stuff. Yeah, or yeah. bring it to life or put their stuff on a t-shirt and say, hey, let's collab. Boom. 
I manufacture t-shirts, whatever it is. Like there's, you just gotta be smart and kind of think outside the box and figure out how you can plug yourself into whatever it is. Yeah. It's really important to, like you said, like attract the right attention where you're like trying to get in front of the right people who maybe are influencers in your space or, uh, or like, like whether that's micro influencers or macro influ- influencers, like, I don't know if you're trying to get with like Jason Derulo, like you said, if you're like into, um, into more of like the music and dance sides of things. Um, but it's really important also on that note to model people, to find someone that you do look up to, to find someone who's done it, who find someone who's walked the path and who's done what you're trying to do or something at least similar and like model what they're doing. So Mm -hmm. research them a lot, understand who they are, understand where they came from because we talked about earlier about hardship and everyone goes through hardship of some type. Everyone goes through it. And most definitely if you're trying to be your own business in being a content creator, an artist, um, any sort of entrepreneurial journey, like you will have hardship. Like Mm -hmm. you will have hardship. You will most likely go super broke (laughs) at some point because you're putting money into hopefully your business and the business isn't generating the sales that you want necessarily yet and you're putting more money in than it's coming in. But it's important to be really like persevering to model what successful people have done and to understand that Hardship is a given. Everyone faces hardship, you know, like in whatever way, shape or form. But if you're an entrepreneur, you will you will face hardship and you will most likely be broke at some point in your life because that's usually when you get the wake up call. Okay, how do I make money or how do I do something with talents that I'm given? Um, And hopefully you don't give up and go to a job. Um, not to say that having a job is important. If you don't, if you don't have any money, you should probably have a job and be doing something and be doing something as a side hustle. Like you said, that girl that does soap, but, but yeah, make it happen. And, yeah. Make it happen. And yeah. don't be scared when struggle, when struggle comes. Cause it don't will be come. scared homie. Yeah, man. Yeah. It's, uh, it's just crazy. It's crazy what you can do and crazy what you have to do. Sometimes, sometimes you have to get that job. If you're about to be evicted, go get a job, man. Like, <laughs> like make that happen. Um, I think what Derek was trying to get at is the freedom of not having to work for someone else as far as your time, right? Not having to spend four, six, eight, 12 hours, you know, a day at a certain place when instead you could be creating and working for yourself, mm-hmm. right? Initially, you're probably not going to make a lot of money working for yourself. I think the first two years, most people aren't profitable, right? Yeah, most yeah. businesses. It's it's a process. Sometimes you are and you kill it and maybe you sell, you know, ten thousand bars of soap in three months. <laughs> Wild. Sometimes that stuff happens, and that's why we try yeah. to use the internet and hope that stuff takes off like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're not gonna know unless you try, right? But yeah, yeah, definitely. And you need to kind of understand the barriers to entry too. You need to understand you need to understand your profit margins because sometimes you want to do something and you're like, this is so cool. I want to do this so bad. I want to make sure it's, I should invest $5,000 into like making shirts. And then you realize the profit margins are like $10 a shirt. So now you have to sell 500 shirts. How are you going to sell 500 shirts if you have a hundred followers? Right? So right. it's like understanding also like the profit side of thing and under, uh, understanding the business model because There are some things that are more profitable than others. And a lot of businesses, like you said, they lose money in their first two years, three years usually. And even, but even so, there are some people, there are some exceptions to that. And that's why it's really important to understand, like I said before, getting creative with money, understanding which method of generating revenue or money is going to be, is going to yield the highest results because. I made a lot of mistakes like back in the day of like, for, like literally the example I just said, buying a bunch of shirts, buying like 5,000 shirts, like these new shirts that I designed, right? So I have like a like closet here, it's like full of, of all these shirts, but it was like, okay, these shirts are selling really well. Like the shirts with this design here with the, with the happy tears and my Medusa shirts were selling great. So I was like, I'm ready to pour in money, design some new shirts, 
bought a bunch of them and realized, wow, I probably should have stuck to what I was doing in making the same designs and producing more of them because even to this day, like those are the shirts that are most ordered. Like, the, like and you gotta, you gotta really listen and be aware of what people are buying instead of just kind of investing heavily in a space that could be really risky. Of course, high risk, high reward, but you wanna be, you want, you wanna take calculated risk for sure because there's always mistakes to be made. Yeah, man. All right, Mike's, Mike's more on you. Um, yeah, dude, especially as an artist, it can be hard because there's things that you like and parts of your art that you like and you think, oh, I like this, so other people are going to like this or you mm-hmm. want them to like it. And so if you force it on them, then what, either everyone's going to like it or they're not. And yep. especially when you're spending money and you're making your art a business, that's where it gets scary, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. And it's just like a song, you know, it's not always going to go your way. You know, sometimes some songs sound amazing, great. Like, you can show your friend a song, oh, this is dope, right? And like, no, dude, that's the worst thing you ever heard. Like, I, I hate that song. Like, why did you, why do you <laughs> listen to that, right? Um, and the same thing with art. Maybe people aren't as dramatic about art, um, but it, it can go the same way. It's like, oh, yeah, man, yeah. I love the Happy Tears thing. And then, like, you know, you can show your cousins like, oh, it's, it's cool. It's whatever. I'm not a big fan of yellow. Whatever. Like, yeah, yeah. it's not going to hit with everybody. But in your case, if this is the one that's popping off, might be a good idea if you're trying to make money off of, of your business and your art to really embrace this and, and run with it. Um, again, that's listening. Awareness on awareness. Yeah, yeah. You know? um, but speaking of you and your art and everything that's going on, um, Let's talk about like getting into murals. What was your hmm. what was your first mural? My first mural was a I painted a women's restroom in Long Beach. It was I, so I submitted a design for an electric box to Ronnie. Shout out Ronnie if you're watching this. Shout out Ronnie uh, or listening to this. The dude uh, Ronnie is. An amazing guy from he's a he's like he's essentially a curator for the city of Long Beach. So what Ronnie and his uh, his partner Ashley, it's Ronnie and Ashley. They're uh, a great great. They're like the dynamic duo, but they're awesome. What they do is they basically uh, they have like a rolodex of artists, and they're constantly looking for more artists. Like in the Long Beach area, they're specific to Long Beach, at least as of now. And what they do is they find projects with the city and then they plug artists with those projects. So at that time, Ronnie was doing, he had, I think like 20 electric boxes across Long Beach. And he was asking me for a concept. He was like, submit a concept for me for an electric box. So I submitted the concept. The concept is a woman that's blowing, uh, she's blowing bubbles and the bubbles uh, turn into smiley faces. And um, I was just thinking, yeah, it'd be really, I thought, I think it'd be really cool on a box. It'd be like interactive. You could walk around the box and kind of see that, like she, that the, the, the kind of give the box like a little bit of motion because, because of the bubbles like flowing in a certain direction. But then he sent me a photo. He, he sent me a text and he said, do it in the restroom. And I said, what? And he sent me this photo <laughs> and do it in the restroom. Bro. <laughs> you heard me. <laughs> um, but he sent me this photo of, uh, a photo that Ashley had made. Ashley's um, the like designer, I guess, on the team, and she had photoshopped the design onto a restroom. So it's actually like a fully engulfing mural. So it's like four walls, and the woman is blowing bubbles on one wall, and the bubbles are kind of going across the whole room. So the whole room is just covered in smiley face bubbles. And uh, I'm not gonna lie, the job wasn't like like a huge payout most times with city job like sometimes with city jobs they can be amazing sometimes the city doesn't have a lot of money kind of depends on who you're talking to in the city but the job wasn't great pay it was an amazing project though like i love doing that project just so that was dope i I, i've seen that one yeah Uh, not in person but at least your your pictures and whatnot and that one is super sick yeah thank you i think it's one that resonates a lot with a lot of people just because it's it's different you know it's it takes up four walls and um it's it's way better than your just plain bathroom 
just yeah, gray yeah. or white and uh, I mean, nothing I going mean, on. A bathroom's only inviting when you need to use it, right? So, <laughs> but like, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was cool. And it was something that it was a really fun project to do and it opened a lot of opportunities and that's where like the value really came in. Like, yeah, the paycheck wasn't amazing, but like I was painting a mural. Like I was like so excited at that, at that point to be able to paint a mural and, it opened the door from there. It's just mural after mural after that. And that's a big thing to know. Like for anyone that's listening that is interested in becoming a muralist, uh, getting a job, getting your first mural job, or even just doing one in your room, whatever it is, like it's fine if it's cheap or even free, because what you're really trying to do at that point is first off, understand how to paint a mural. You can't be expected to be paid thousands of dollars if you've never painted a mural before, but understanding, um, how the whole process works to developing a mural, get it. And it will open up doors for you, especially if it's in a public space too, because if it's in a public space, a lot of people are going to see it. A lot of people are going to follow you on Instagram. If your art resonates with a business owner, they might hit you up and be like, wow, I saw your mural at in uh, the art expo in Long Beach. Like, I loved it. Can you do a mural for us? And that's really, that's one of the more powerful things about murals is it's the referral network is great. Mm -hmm. And, once you get to a certain point, you don't have to necessarily be generating all these leads and like constantly hunting for jobs. It's like once you've done X amount of murals, I don't know exactly what that amount is, but once you have done X amount of public murals where a lot of people see them, or maybe your social media following is great just based on like some private murals too, that's that's great too. But once enough people have seen them, word gets out and there's a lot of muralists, but it's not like a giant, giant community. So it's uh it's important to get the job be excited about doing it give it your all like give it everything you got because it's a reflection like we said earlier like your work is a reflection of yourself nothing's going to be perfect but make it the best you possibly can and more opportunities will come from it i mean i i've yet to i've yet to meet anyone who's only said they've painted one mural before like solely on their own that didn't get that had nothing come of it um that's just specific to the mural world for anyone listening. Well, I mean, that actually goes, I think, for a lot of things. There's a couple things there. Uh, mm -hmm. One, being smart and, again, awareness on awareness is, like, for, like, murals. And yeah. for that, you know, it pops, right? You're not really expecting, you know, a bunch of crazy stuff going on in the bathroom, on the walls, and, and on the doors and stuff. Um, but it catches people's attention. Mm -hmm. And especially, I think, for, like, big part of where you're going, especially if you ever end up doing murals in a retail space, which I know you're knowledgeable about. Um, but for those listening and watching, you know, you ever go to maybe like a trendy spot and they have this thing, some, ah, I forgot what it was, one place has like a, like a telephone and things like a pink telephone or whatever. And like you always take pictures with it and everyone knows, mm -hmm. okay, I'm here. Or um, is it Paul Frank? Who's that, that pink wall in LA? Is it, I forgot who, who does it, but like. I'm not sure. Almost any too many murals in LA. Any girl, <laughs> and it, it's just a plank. Uh, plank. It is a plain pink wall, and like oh really? Almost every mm. time I see a girl uh, who's like not from South, Southern California, like go to LA, they take a picture in yeah. front of this pink wall, and it's just like there's not even anything going on there. It's just a color. Yep. Um, but a photo op, you know, that is huge for businesses. To be like, oh, dude, I got my ice cream thing. Boom. Whether, like, uh, I think the snow monster has some crazy things or, you know, a lot of, like, you know, stuff going on. Oh, the loop. The loop. I like that thing. Um, I still have yet to go, but I've seen it all over Instagram where the churro literally starts in the cup of ice cream and it loops back in. Dope. Creative. I Super simple. <laughs> and it just, it, it pops. You know, it catches your eye. People take pictures of it. Boom. Free marketing right there. Mm -hmm. Right. Same idea, which is why I imagine, you know, you're going to be doing pretty well and people are probably going to see more of your art um, and more of like the retail space, whether it be for like a clothing store or um, like I said, like a lot of restaurants and dessert shops. Dessert shops kill it with that kind of stuff. Um, I think after is ice cream in Irvine at Diamond Jamboree. Yeah. I don't know what they have going on right now, but when I was there a while back, they had this huge uh, Rick and Morty. Uh, mural where they have like the oh, little sick. green teleportation you yeah, know, yeah. portal. Um, 
So I need, hopefully it's still there because I want to take a picture where I jump out. <laughs> Looks like I'm teleporting, but like stuff like that. Like I want to go take a picture there. Not necessarily because I want to go get ice cream, but because it's like, oh, dude, that art thing is super cool. Hey, what's up, little dog? <laughs> hey, 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 hey. We just got infiltrated. Hey, what's up? This is totally going in. Hello. <laughs> My dog just uh, entered Yo, dog. the room here. Uh, we's got, we got time for our furry homies here. All about it. That interruption is totally fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then, look okay, at how my, my voice peaked in this thing. It's so awesome. Um, love dogs. All right. <laughs> um, yeah, going back and touching on the other point is doing free work, right? Mm-hmm. Obviously, if you can get paid, get paid. But yeah. when you don't have any of a follow, like you don't have any views, you don't have a following, you don't have that much content, you got to do something. So if you're not able to practice at home, or create somehow on a personal scale mm-hmm. that hopefully doesn't cost you very much money. One great way to get yourself out there is to look up a business that you might want to like, or a business that is like in the industry that you might want to do work with or for. Um, say you want to do art for Chipotle, you know, in all their chains, right? Maybe try to offer it at one specific location. Yeah, yeah. Hey, boom, can I do this for you? Right, I'll do it absolutely for free. But now your work is inside uh, Chipotle. Chipotle. Yeah. Hopefully, you choose a busy one, right? Mm-hmm. And doing stuff like that, whether it's oh, hey man, uh, I'm a producer. Um, I make beats. Here, here's a, you know, a free little sample thing. Mm-hmm. Some a thirty second thing. Maybe they'll just use that, or maybe they'll just use like a little a, a little sample of like a guitar or your drum beat. Or you send them a whole freaking song, whatever. Yeah, maybe that song took you a few hours to put together, but at least maybe mm-hmm. so and so, Kanye West, Russ, maybe get your your small like local guys to go ahead and use it. Putting yourself out there, right? Uh, maybe like for my martial arts friends, right? If you're trying to network and say, or maybe be like a, a trainer or a personal trainer, right? Maybe take on some free clients. Take yeah. someone who's struggling right now, is in the best shape, give them a few months, boom, look, this is what I did. I can Social totally do proof. this for you too, Yeah, yeah. right? And that sounds like that's basically what happened with your mural in Long Beach. It's like, hey, look, boom, I did this thing. I can work on a large scale or and or give you great results in you know a huge way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, man, look, you already have mm-hmm. something there. Maybe it's as simple as just like, here's some stickers. Stickers are really cheap. Throw them out there. Yeah. You know, maybe it ends up on someone's laptop or the notebook. And someone's like, oh, hey, what's that thing? Boom. You know, if you can get a QR code yeah, on QR it, code. kill yeah. it, do it. Yeah, put a QR code on your And then, or at least your app, you, you know, so people can find you. And then you never know who's going to come across like, oh, dude, that'd be super cool if I can have, you know, this in my business or even my home. Or, oh, man, I'd love for them, you know, to be, you know, on, on my album or something, whatever it is, you know, don't be afraid to do free stuff. Obviously have a threshold, be smart about it. Yeah. Be smart about Try it. Try not to spend, you know, uh, thousands and thousands of dollars if it's just you and your personal uh, budget, but yeah, you just got to get out there sometimes. Yeah. And, um, uh, doing free work is very controversial. Um, I know my Phil friends, uh, probably, Hate me a little bit, love me a little bit, but sometimes you just got to get that experience. Yeah, it's it depends, right? It depends on where you're at. It depends on it's. And I've done free be- work just for those of you mm-hmm. um, listening. So I'm not just speaking from a, a point of privilege. It's like, hey, I've actually been yeah, there yeah. And almost everything I've done. I've done free work. I still do free stuff here and there just to get out, and make that connection. It's a type of networking, you just got to be smart about your decision to do so. Yeah. You got to be smart about it. You got to think strategically, right? Like if if I'm going to do free work for someone, it better be for someone who can get me more jobs or who can bring, who can bring me more value. Right. So like, for example, if you're doing a mural in a public space and you're doing it for free, like everyone's going to see it, right? If you're doing uh, if you're doing an art piece for someone on Instagram with a huge following, say like maybe you do something for uh, someone with like 
80,000 followers and you did a piece of work for them and they loved it and they uploaded it, then you have that chance of getting exposure, right? You want to be careful though, because like you don't want to be doing like, if you're doing free work for like Justin Bieber or like, I don't know, say, uh, who else? Like, uh, Charlie D'Angelo, like, like you were saying, like these people like get so they get spam with so much stuff like that all day. So it's like your work really has to stand out. I think it needs to be, you need to be strategic in how, who you do free work for if you're doing free work or say that you're willing to donate work, like especially in the mural space, like if you donate to a strategic loca location, strategic business that can open more opportunities, that's important. You don't wanna be doing work for free from people you just don't know that are hitting you up and you're like, hey, we'll give you exposure if you wanna do free work for us. A lot of times that's kind of just like really, uh, just almost like scammy and they're just trying to like, take hey, advantage of we you. we like your stuff, we just don't wanna pay or spend any yeah. money. That's just like, that's taking advantage of you, you know? And like, if anything, if you're doing free work, you should be offering the free work. It should be a donation sort of deal or doing it as a passion project for someone that you think is really cool or a company that you think is really cool. If someone is approaching you and asking you for something for free, like usually they're just trying to take advantage of you. If you're like, maybe they'll offer you some value along the line. Maybe you can, or like if, if, if someone wants to do that, you can, you can try to incentivize some sort of mm -hmm. trade deal where like, I don't know, Chipotle is like, we do free work for us. It's like, yeah, if you give me like a year full of free burritos or something like that. Right. There well, has to be some sort of depends. exchange or leverage um, yeah, yeah. that they're offering in return for your work. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it's risk versus reward, mm -hmm. right? Maybe doing, a, like I said, a public mural in, uh, say, a, like a park or maybe a mall. That's super popular. Yeah. And I was like, all right, cool. I'll do it for free as long as I can, you know, sign QR code at whatever, mm -hmm. right, so people can find me. And if there's 10,000 people going there every single day, that might be an excellent spot to put your work yeah, or yeah. perform and, you know, do some music covers, right, out in public, you know. It's called busking. You just get out there and hustle and get in front of people the old school way. Yeah. Um, and even for comedy. I like the old go, school way. There's there's people doing a comedy <laughs> in the park now. Um, different vibe than a club or uh, an arena. But, um, you know, if you get in front of people and you're increasing awareness, then that's usually a pretty good, pretty good yeah. exchange. Right? And if they can give you something like, oh, hey, like you said burritos from Chipotle. Great. I love Chipotle videos. I'll yeah. take it for sure. Um, be smart about it. There, some, especially companies, businesses, they should be able to go ahead and give you something, if not a connection, a phone number, an email, a plug, send it over to someone, right? Okay, great. You did this thing for us. We're going to go ahead um, and we'll, we'll send it to our Know, creative directors Definitely. higher up at, at corporate you know there has to be some sort of like okay you know either it's going to be mass exposure or you know if something that they're giving you if it's not money or moving you on and passing you along to someone that can help connect you to the next thing yeah um otherwise exactly. you know most people like i said people that are, that are going out of the way to hit you up to ask for free work and they don't offer anything it's like Oh, people will see it was like, eh, if you're not giving me hard, solid numbers, you're probably just trying to make your stuff look cool. Yeah. If you're using art or you just want my beat for free because you don't want to make it or pay someone else, you know, you, you, you gotta be smart. Yeah. You know, um, talk to people. That's part of networking too. Things good. Um, mm -hmm. I'm glad like we're talking now just to have people to be like, Hey man, um, does this sound like a good deal to you? You know? Build that network. Have some people you can go to and trust uh, to ask those sort of questions on top of, you know, bouncing ideas off of. Um, networking is not purely just for making money or, yeah, you know, not. building awareness. Sometimes it's just someone to check in and say, hey, dude, does this make sense? Or how are you feeling? Like sometimes you don't even talk about art or your business. Sometimes just like you need someone who knows what you're doing, right, and understands what being a creative or a business owner is like. And just be like, oh man, you know, da 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 happened, and they can relate, and they can speak in your yeah, terms. Yeah. You know, it's really important. Networking in in general is super important because 
it offers a lot of opportunity. Like the bigger your network is, the more opportunities you're going to have. It's just how it goes. Like the more people, it's not, it's not what you know, or it's who you know, right? Like that's common saying. And the more people that you know, especially in your space or in related spaces, the more opportunities you're going to be presenting themselves. But like you said, sometimes a network isn't always just about value exchange. Like sometimes you just want to do something nice for someone or they want to do something nice for you. And I think that's that's like kind of an important thing going into something like going into like your friends, right? And developing like an inner circle of people that you like regularly converse with. Right. Because you're like, you're the product of your five closest friends. So you want to have friends that are in a similar space, in a similar space to you who are positive. So you can be a positive person and are just like really focused on growth and don't like hold you back. Because if like, you have like two or three best friends that are like kind of doing nothing with their life and just playing video games like all the time. And like, I mean, not to say that no, there's nothing wrong with, with video games, you know, and like I know that there's some like professional gamers and stuff. I mean, if you're killing it on Twitch, go for it. But. Yeah, 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 exactly. And and I mean, like if there's if there's a future there for you, like amazing. But like if you're just doing some like some like passive you know, passive hobby. menial hobby and right. doing it all day long and that's what your friends are doing like what are your friends going to ask you to do they're going to ask you to do that you know what i mean so like you want to make sure that like if that's who your friends are that you're surrounding yourself with people who are productive who want who are doing things that you want to do like and that's really important part of networking too because you can't like you can't find those friends. You can't find people that are amazing if you're not networking. You have to be constantly meeting people and trying to get involved in uh, in new spaces and learn things from people. And yeah, so networking is really important just for opportunities, for friendships, um, and also understanding who you shouldn't network with or who you know sometimes is just better left as. An acquaintance or an old friend rather than a friend that's with you forever, you know? Right. And then same thing on uh, the business side. Who's better off just being a business, you know, associate or a partner that you just collab with? Sometimes getting personal with certain people isn't going to work out in your favor. Yeah, yeah. Um, So, again, it goes back to awareness. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, dude. um, It's crazy. I think one of the, again, just being able to practice and create, like, like, Hey, Derek, can you make me this little, like a picture of a dog, right? Mm -hmm. I want to have a dog t-shirt. Great. Boom. You're my artist friend that can make t-shirts. Great. I'm going to ask Derek to do it, you know? Um, Or maybe it's like, hey, Christian, uh, I know you're going to go perform here. You're going to go either do music or stamp or whatever. Or on your next podcast, can you wear my shirt? No problem. I can wear a t-shirt. Something super simple. That way you can keep your friends going, you know, especially Mm -hmm. if you have a group that's just like all hustling all the time and trying to go on to the next thing. You all come up together. Right. And it's like, Oh, Hey dude, this thing just happened for me. This is why it happened. X, Y, Z being able to break it down. Like, Hey, you might want to try this out too, because I just had a really great success with this practice or formula or whatever it may be. And again, if you don't have that network, it's going to be hard to do it on your own. Not saying that you can't, but it's going to be a lot easier if you have, you know, fellow like-minded people that you can always just go to. Um, I even, I'm part of like a photographer group chat on Twitter just because yeah. I just like commented on someone's stuff and just said they were dope. And I'm like in photography Twitter now, even though I'm not like a legit photographer, I mess around here and there and I like, you know, I try to make my photos look nice and I'll take like artsy photos and whatever like on my phone. But by no means do I consider myself like, you know, a full fledged photographer. But I'm in that space just because, you know, comment. I got out there and yeah, I networked. And I'm trying to do that more now too, is just comment on people's stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's just, just hit, like if someone posts a story, send them a message like, hey, so this morning I saw someone that like we may have like had a conversation in passing here and there like years ago. Um, she's from like the dance community. Um, and my cousins were dancers and whatnot. So I was always around going to shows and whatnot. Um, and she got a car crash this, uh, or I don't know, it was this morning. I think it was like posted. So yesterday, but it was on her story. I saw it this morning. I was like, Hey, I know we don't talk much, but I hope you and whoever else was with you, uh, was okay. Jeez. Yeah. Right. 
that's a totally different thing. Please just be nice to people in general. Yeah, just be but nice. Maybe it's like, oh, hey, you just posted a, a new photo of a t shirt or you did a new mural or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's something as simple as saying, oh, hey, dude, Re- like replying to the story or commenting on the picture saying, that's dope. Fire yeah. emoji, whatever, you know, make yeah, it super yeah, yeah. simple. Do something, especially if they're someone you know, your friend. Most of these apps have an automatic, like, suggested emoji little bracket. So just like, go ahead, tap a few of those, have at it. You know, get out there, be part of the conversation, you know, be, be positive, get out there. Yeah. I mean, people respond to either extreme talent, extreme positivity, and extreme controversy. I have mm-hmm. a hard time <laughs> being on that yeah. controversial side, not really trying to be on that side. And I love positivity. I think people like to feel good. And, and yeah, if you're yeah. talented on top of that, great. Those two things are just hand in hand. Success, mm-hmm. you know, together. That's two and two. Um, but yeah, guys, just be smart. Be smart. Again, that's awareness. Like, who do you want in your circle? Yeah. Like, who makes sense for you? Yeah. And talking about like the networking side that you just discussed, like sometimes networking is really as simple as commenting or sending a DM. Like, you never know who's going to reply. Even if they're huge, they might reply. They might follow you back. Uh, and you could just develop like you could develop a relationship with a uh, big business or like a just like a cool artist like online. Like you could just develop it with them like just through a message or something. Um, but yeah, speaking of uh, networking and inner circles, my partner just pulled up to the building. So is it cool if I just go grab her real quick? She's our creative director. Heck yes, cool. We still got a little bit of time. We'll get her in here. We'll be right back in three, two, and all right. And we're back. I mean, for you guys, it doesn't seem like any time has passed at all because it's only been literally like a second or two. But for us, it's been about like five minutes. All right, who do we have here now? My name is Lisa. And I am Hi, a creative director at Disorganized <laughs> Depictions. Yes. And how did you get involved with this amazing brand? Well, I have kind of been on my own journey of figuring out how to create something and be a part of something in the creative space. Um, I've been an entrepreneur myself and having a lot of different businesses and branding and working in the space of branding and advertising. And meeting Derek and seeing him as the product, it seemed like such a great opportunity for expansion and making this into something way more. And I knew that he had goals of being really in depth with the artist community and making a collective out of it and inspiring other artists. And I saw it as also a great opportunity to be able to take the branding and the advertising that I love to do and give that in the art space and be a part of that and come up with, you know, unique new ways for people to reach new audiences. And it just ended up working out perfectly in timing of coming together and formulating this new and even greater journey for disorganized depictions. Heck yeah. All right. So I have um, some other quick fun questions about um, (laughs) disorganized depictions. So if you could describe... Derek's style of art in one sentence, how would you say it? I would say Derek's style of art is very vibrant anime pop art. That's what I would say. It's a little specific, but I would just say anything that he creates is very vibrant and geared towards positive vibes. Obviously, you've seen the smiley faces and other people checking us out will see that. And Mm -hmm. everything he's trying to do is just geared toward giving somebody that moment of feeling like they saw something that was vibrant and made them feel positive. And that's how I describe the style that he's going for and the emotion he's going for in his art. All right. Now we're going to get real here. What are his top three skills either as an artist or a business owner slash both? Well, I would say his number one skill is growth. Everything he ever does is focused on the next level that he can achieve and how he can be better and how he can help and how he can guide. He's constantly looking into 
videos and podcasts and reading books and applying everything he can and it shows in his work and what he's creating. I would say number two would be communication. He's always trying to find new ways to understand another person or understand a client and really be able to provide people with what's going to leave them feeling at their best. And number three is that he is just very light and positive and fun. So he tries to make everything creative and he tries to make everything exciting for everyone and bring this energy to the room yeah. and have his sometimes funny jokes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so he's just, you know, he brings all those things together. And when you really look at entrepreneurs and people achieving things in the business world, sometimes those things and that lightness and that fun or that self-growth can be kind of le left out. So it's really amazing to work side by side with someone who is driven to continue always bringing that to the table. That's awesome. Sweet. If there is one thing more than anything that you think maybe you guys have to overcome or maybe something that Derek could overcome <laughs> getting brutal honest here um just keep genuine just so just being real and f what is maybe the one thing that if we or got over this then you'd see a, a huge leap or a level up I think honestly this I mean this would probably go more in depth towards us working together and be in partnership. This is something that is his pride and joy. It's his baby. And he started this two years ago. It's really been him. You know, like the company is a soul is him mm -hmm. deep down and being a part of that. I can't imagine, especially because I had a company I did before and I had such a hard time even just bringing employees and like team members on, you know, and let, letting those responsibi responsibilities letting go. go and yeah. yeah, just like letting go of little things and and bigger things and now that he's bringing me in and making me a partner in it and it's more than just being an employee it's like a whole nother level probably just the part of releasing that and mm. having trust and having faith and and also taking in that you know i see what he wants and i see like the vision he's going for but to testament against that though like there has been a lot of growth in that area already in the last few weeks of just really grinding on and breeding on more team members and more interns and things like that. He has definitely strived in focusing on letting go of little parts and giving me a lot of freedom as well. So I think that it will just be, a, you know, something to continue working on for it's both of tough. us. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm in that boat all the time. We're just like, okay, cool. Like I know I can do this thing really well, but I myself would do better if I could focus on these aspects. There's only so much yeah. time in the day. And that's where expansion is key, is getting people to go ahead and do those other things. Yeah. But being able to trust that they will carry out your vision, you know, it's, it's scary because people can make mistakes. They can mess up. Definitely. Or there could be a hiccup in the communication of or the interpretation of what you said. And so, you know, you know, I commend you for taking this next step and bring new people on and yeah, yeah. and growing the business, the brand, and yourself at the same time. It's it's a hard thing to do, especially as an artist. But yeah, um, here, did bring it up to your mouth. There you go. Yeah, I think the uh, the control aspect of a business is something where a lot of different people, uh, including myself. And I guess at least in the past, it's it's hard to like let go of a little bit control and give other people free reign because you want to just you have your vision, right? Like usually as the person that's starting things, like that's the founder, you have this vision for the company and where it's going to go. And it's really important that when you are bringing on people that they do fit the culture, they fit into that vision. They're similar to the uh, values that are within your company. Like the reason why Lisa's on board is because she's creative. She's always working on herself. She's always growing. Um, she's an amazing uh, team builder. Like she's she she's helping me a lot right now with building out the disorganized depictions team. She's helping me put together the collective. She's really good with people. She's she's very inspiring in what she does as well. So it's really important to understand that when you're bringing on people, they need to fit that culture. And uh, but yeah, like letting go of control is is really important. 
in uh, in business. Like earlier when you were talking about the the uh, the girl that was selling soap on mm-hmm. on Twitter, right? Like you said, it's it's just She's her and she has all, all right, these orders all by herself. Yeah, there's there's this point to where you need to understand like it's just easier with more people. And it took me a little while to get to that point, and I probably should have got there a little bit sooner rather than later. But especially when you're talking about someone like that, like she has a kid that she's taking care of. She's selling soaps and like how much time is she allocating? I mean, we don't know how much time she's allocating between the two. But if she could take someone on, pay them a small portion of whatever the business is making, like even if she was to pay them hourly and they're only making 5% of what she's taking off the top, like that's more time with her. That's 20 to 40 more hours with her kid, Mm -hmm. right? So it's important to understand that like, they're going to help they're here like the team the team portion of that is here to help and you just need to be careful with who you're taking right. on and because you want consistency yeah but you also yeah. want to leverage the time that you do have and the efficiency and like you said mm-hmm. by holding yourself back by not expanding you especially once you start seeing the new leaps and improvements and opportunities that come with having an actual team then you're like, oh man, what if I just did this a month ago, a week ago, or yeah. last year? Um, shout out to Fraser. It's my man who uh, edits all the podcast. I know if I did this, I've I edited the first few, and it takes time. It definitely takes time. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, so yeah, and then just identifying strengths, right? If you're, yeah, you can be good at a lot of things, but if your primary strength, especially in this business for you, is creating the actual art, right? That makes a lot of sense for you to focus on that. Mm -hmm. And so having people who are primarily focused on outreach and sales and just getting your brand out there, then that's great. Even though you're good at that and you know how to get people's attention, talk to people and network, and you understand that, being able to understand that someone else understands that is key too, right? And so it's a crazy process. Um, and like Gary Vee said, you can always fire people. So don't mess up these things. <laughs> okay? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm big on that. Uh, hopefully, you, you don't have to fire anyone. You know, that's, that's the goal is to be able to identify like, okay, these are things we're looking for. Show us some proof, right? Um, but at the end of the day, you know, you got to be smart with your <laughs> staffing as well. You can't, I'm like, good luck. I'm just yeah. kidding. <laughs> that extra 1% will help you, but uh, um, Lisa has, through. Lisa's already fired me from uh, disorder. <laughs> Multiple any, times. Any, any, inter- any interns watching this know that Lisa's actually fired me. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. Um, and Lisa, I mean, Derek's been talking about you and um, share a little bit about yourself. What have you done? I know you're you have your own creative journey and I'd love to do <laughs> another episode yeah. with you, either both of you or just you, or maybe we'll do both. Yeah, no, um, definitely. I'm trying to think of how to have a short summary, but I guess uh, for me, um, most of the creative stuff that I had started doing since I was little was music and writing. So I always did poetry and I did music. And when you're in the creative space, I always, it's a very familiar thing to expand and doing different things. Mm-hmm. So I guess I've, been doing art or painting and sketching for the last few years but it's not something you know at a serious level where that was primarily how I started as an artist but um, I've always been deeply involved in the creative community and from there I really loved being able to identify people's personalities in the music industry and a lot of other industries similar to that and help them grow and help them see their vision and help align the goals they needed to get there. And when I got into college, I took a course and I was able to work for a franchise and I rebranded them. And from there, I worked for Red Bull as a brand manager. I started picking up my own clients. I started working with startups and it felt like what I was doing when I was younger and in high school and I was working in studios with musicians and and being my own artist and identifying what they needed to show to people. Mm -hmm. I was now doing this for companies and I started one of my own separate businesses into something that I was passionate about. So I just really grew in the entrepreneurship community. But what's funny was like, I never knew I was an entrepreneur until I took this one creativity course in the entrepreneurship major. And I was like, oh my gosh, other people are coming up with hundreds of ideas every day. Like it was insane because I felt so out of it. I didn't feel like anyone related to me. And then once I was around this community of other entrepreneurs, 
And I was showing them in my notes, like, here's 20 ideas I wrote down for businesses that oh, like yeah. I could come up with. And I had this one friend, Jeff, who he had like thousands of just like written down. And I was like, oh my gosh. He's okay. Proud. So I'm here in the community I'm supposed to be in. And and that journey just expanded into a lot of growth and failure in different ways. You know, I started different businesses that failed out and I have come into what I'm a part of now. And this really just made, like I said before, made a lot of sense for me in the creative space, me as an artist, me as a creator, and me wanting to also inspire other entrepreneurs and being an entrepreneur. It just made so much sense. So it's really amazing. It feels like I kind of have that like spark back that I had when I first got introduced to all those things in that world. That's awesome. Being a part of um, what he started. Heck yeah. All right. I think that's a <laughs> sick little preview for when I get to talk to you more and dive into your background even deeper and whatever else you may have going on right now. Um, so share this guys, you listeners, you watchers, if you're not watching, you could listen if that's more convenient while you're driving. If you're listening, you could be watching. And this time, <laughs> thanks to Disorganized Depictions and Derek's camera uh, for recording <laughs> the visual side. Cut out a couple times, but you'll get to see uh, my pretty face or maybe I'll throw some pictures of Derek instead. <laughs> so uh, yes, uh, don't keep getting sick of me. Um, so thank you, Lisa, Derek, Disorganized Depictions, guys. If you want some streetwear, check them out. If you have a business or know a business, that could use a little bit of a swagger upgrade on the inside or outside the building. Make those walls look nice and pretty. You know, <laughs> these are your www.storynicepictures.com. <laughs> <laughs> Shameless plug. Yeah, check out links in the description. <laughs> Until then, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for Thank having you. us. All right. Alrighty, guys, thank you so much for tuning in, whether you were listening or watching to the episode. I appreciate any time that you guys are tuning in. If you want to become one of those monthly subscribers or donators, whatever you like to call it, you can go ahead and follow the link to our Anchor website if you just follow the link in the description. And that way you can do as little as 99 cents, 99 cents per month up to 9.99 per month. So that way I have a little bit more time to go ahead to spend with the guest, finding guests, talking to them, editing the episodes, getting Frasier on this so you can go ahead and make the sound uh, nice and easy to digest. I'm trying to make these uh, little upgrades too as far as the equipment so that way it's more presentable for you folks. I'd love to do more episodes and I need your help to do that. So even if you can't donate, please just share the love, share the links to the episodes, whether you're watching or listening on Anchor, YouTube, whatever it may be. I appreciate your support, guys. Go ahead, check out the description so you can keep up with Derek and Disorganized Depictions as well. There's a lot going on there. So you're going to see him blow up pretty soon, I, I swear. Just from the time that we spoke to me actually getting this episode out, he's done a lot. You're going to see some great things from him. So go ahead, give him a follow. And anyone else you want to see, go ahead, throw him my way, guys. We're doing some awesome things here. Alrighty, folks, once again, thanks for tuning in. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and bye-bye.